today, a gorgeous March Saturday here in the Sunshine State. So we will be with you the next hour to answer your questions. 877-943-9673. 877-943-9673. You can always email your question, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. And with me, the gang, Yana, the Belarusian producer, and we have Jose, the call screener, back with us today while Brian, the call screener, is on a well-earned vacation. And with me in studio, my very special guest, the one, the only, Dwayne Bischoff, CPA. Good morning, Dwayne. Good morning. Dwayne has uh, been the CPA that I've worked with most regularly for, I don't know, gosh, Dwayne, it's been at least 10 years now, yeah. probably a little bit longer than that. So... Dwayne is uh, sort of the guy I go to for all things tax. We sort of teased this a little bit last week when we talked about uh, kind of sort of the abnormal tax laws around the state and the differences and uh, how people kind of tax things differently state by state, so the odd things they tax. So Dwayne's here today specifically to answer any tax-specific questions you may have, in addition to me answering your legal questions. And we are happy to help any way we can. So your questions today can actually be legal questions or tax questions either. And that number to call in, 877-943-9673, 877-943-9673, or email me, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. Dwayne, let's just start a little bit about you, kind of where you're from, background, that sort of good CV information. So I'm I'm uh, one of the few that's born here in Tampa, and um, went to public schools. Went to the uh, University of South Florida. Got married early out of high school, uh, and uh, started working for a CPA firm while I was still in high school. Worked full time while I was in college, and um, went on my own probably about 25 years ago. And Dwayne is uh, an expert in all things tax. Anytime I have a uh, complicated especially income tax question. Uh, we were you know, talking in uh, the four major transfer taxes. You know, attorneys get peppered with questions all the time about gift tax or estate tax or generation skipping tax. But when it comes to income tax, our response is pretty uniform, I think, for a lot of attorneys just saying, call an accountant. Because when it comes to income tax, it is one of those situations where it is so nuanced. And I'll never forget, I was doing a, a research, a deep dive, on a particularly complex, it was an issue regarding, I don't want to bore the audience, but it was a detailed tax issue. But I got down so far in the footnotes, and you know those C so-and-so, and I had gone to like 10 of those. Well, the last footnote I chased down the rabbit trail said, congratulations, if you've gotten this far and you still haven't figured it out, just hire an accountant like everyone else. And I'll never forget that. And it taught me a valuable lesson. When it comes to income taxes, which, you know, everyone pays those if you earn an income. And it's one of those things where you need a professional a lot of times because we, we talk about, uh, you know, on our show, um, uh, we talk about the people who do pro forma doc services and things like that. And there's lots of tax services out there. So, Dwayne, talk a little bit about – why people need a tax professional in their life. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's there's some good software out there, but you have to have an idea first of what you're doing. A typical example, I had a, a guy who had followed a, he created a corporation, and he thought he would use TurboTax to do his return, and he filed his return as a sole proprietor for years and years and got a notice from the state of Florida that he never filed his corporate tax return. He said, sure, I did. Well, he didn't even know that it takes a separate tax return. Plus, so there's some basic information you have to know. So the turbo taxes and those things, they're fine if you're an employee without any other kind of complications, no investments. You just earn a W-2. It's pretty basic. You know, you can get away with it. Once you start getting into, if you have your own business, if you have investments, if you have rental properties, there's a whole lot of complicated rules and that you can get stuck with. You may be leaving yourself short with deductions if you don't, you know, get a professional. My anxiety spiked when you said that about <laughs> that because that is like one of my worst fears is missing something. And so that's the reason why I work with not only Dwayne, but having a tax professional gives me peace of mind of yep. knowing that it's that it's covered and protected. 
If you have a question for myself, the legal questions will come here. The tax questions will head straight to Dwayne. He's with us for the hour, 877-943-9673. I'm your local Central Florida attorney, Patrick Smith, 877-943-9673. And with us in studio, my very special guest, CPA Dwayne Bischoff. You can also email your questions, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. All right, let's go to Plant City and let's talk to, is it Joey? Yes. Hey, Joey. Welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. How are you today? Good. Doing good. Good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Happy to do it, Joey. How can we help? Okay. So I'm just now retiring, and I own my own house. My question is, is what is there is there a way, if, if something happens and I have to go into a, an assisted living, what can I do to protect my house that they cannot get that? I can leave it to my children. Do I add their names to the deed, or do I put it in some kind of, you know, a different account? Or is that something that, no matter what, as an asset, they'll get that? Well, Joey, first of all, congratulations on the retirement. Thank you. How many years, or do you mind sharing what you did previously from which you retired? Well, I worked for the school system, and we worked with incarcerated students. Incarcerated students. Yeah, sounds like you. Like twenty five years. You definitely had a captive audience. It sounds like. Oh yes. Okay. Definitely. All right. So at the end of the day, was this residence your primary residence? Is it your primary residence? Your homestead? Yes. Property? Okay. It is. So the good news is, as long as it's within a half acre in the city limits, or if you're outside of the city limits, it's up good up to one hundred and sixty acres. It's already protected, Joey. There's nothing additionally you need to do. The state constitution under Article 10, Section 4 gives you a creditor protection, a homestead creditor protection uh, from any creditors except two. There's exceptions for if you don't pay your property taxes, obviously. And then there is a uh, an exception for what we call a mechanics lien. If you pay so, or if you hire someone to do work on your property, like put in a pool and then don't pay them, they can obviously lien the property. But outside of those exceptions... Uh, your home's already creditor protected from like an assisted living facility. You would have to actively go out of way to compromise that protection. And one of the things you can do that would compromise that protection is add a child's name to the home. Because if you add a child's name to the home and that child already has their home, they can't have two homesteads. So you've at least lost part of the homestead exemption. And if you add a okay. child's, go ahead. Okay. So I am a widow, so it is one of those things where, and I have three children, so it depends on which child I would put it under. Well, and here's the thing. What I would suggest, when you talk about adding the child's name, is your goal really protecting it from the creditor, or is there some other goal you have in mind? No, it's from the, you know, from the creditor. Yeah. I want to, once I pass, the kids to have the house. Ah, there's the second goal. There's the second goal. So you want to protect (laughs) it from the creditor and you want to pass it to the children. To best achieve that, if you add a child's name to the home, you're going to trigger gift taxes, which, of course, Dwayne can expound upon that. In addition to that, if you put a child's name on the home, they have their homestead, you lose part of your homestead exemption because they can't have two. And now if their name's on the deed and they're in some sort of accident that generates a liability, like an auto accident, or if they go through a divorce, now your property is potentially subject to that matter. The most optimal way to achieve your goal to preserve the existing homestead exemption you already have under the state constitution and pass it along to your children as a tax efficiently and uh, efficiently economically as possible would be to create something called a simple trust, it sounds like, because the trust will bypass the probate process, which is your goal, passing it along post-mortem as quickly and simply as possible, while avoiding gift taxes, liability exposure, and maintaining your 100% homestead creditor exemption. Oh, that's perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. And I do that, too, and then turning. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We'll be happy to help you with it. If you give us a call at the office on Monday, we'll get you started on that. Okay, Joey? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Joey, thank you. And, uh, again, congratulations on the retirement. I think that's fantastic. Thank Enjoy. you very much. Yes, ma'am. All right, Bye-bye. you're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith, and with me in studio, my very special guest, CPA Dwayne Bischoff, here to answer your tax questions while I'm fielding the Legal questions, Dwayne, a little bit of a tax consequence there. A lot of people do that all the time where they add a child's name to stuff 
and not realizing there's a present interest annual exclusion and there's gift taxes. Maybe you could expound a little bit about that. Right. So what happens is um, they, they, they have created a gift. Um, the gift. The gift is at fair market value. And so the problem comes in is when, let's say it's a house and mom bought the house 30 years ago and it cost $30,000. And now it's valued at three hundred thousand dollars, so she's passing it to them on you know at a value of three hundred thousand dollars. But their basis is at the thirty thousand dollar level. So when she passes, and they sell this property, they have a two hundred built in two hundred seventy thousand dollar gain. Whereas if they did what you just suggested and put it in a trust, and they re- received a post mortem. They would get us under the current laws. They'd get a step up to the three hundred thousand. If they sold it, they'd have no gain. There you go. So if you have a question for myself or Dwayne, eight seven seven nine four three nine six seven three eight seven seven nine four three nine six seven three, or you can email me Patrick at attorneypatricksmith dot com. All right, let's go to my home county of Polk County and go to Lakeland and let's talk to Craig. Craig, welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, Craig. I have a I have a sticky situation. My wife in the 80s left her abusive wife and moved back to her home country of Nicaragua. Uh, We have three properties there, and the American government has no diplomatic relation with Nicaragua. And the possibility is she might be selling one of her houses there. And we're wondering what kind of... uh, Tax we're going to have to pay when she if she sells that house and wants to bring the proceeds to America. Dwayne, it's all you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the real thing is that she's got a sale. So you would look at the value of the house, you know, when she bought it, compared to the value of the house when she sold it. And you, if you're a U.S. citizen, you have your tax on your world uh, worldwide income. So you would report it if there was a conversion in currency to dollars, you'd convert it to U.S. dollars and report it on your return. It'd probably be a long-term capital gain. Um, If the Nicaraguan country charged any income tax, you would figure out a foreign tax credit and get credit for the tax that you have paid there. They don't want double taxation. And I have a follow-up on to Craig's question. So if you sold the Nicaraguan property and converted it to cash and deposited it into a Nicaraguan bank, because the funds originated in the sale of Nicaraguan real property, would you still have to file an FBAR? Yes. Okay. And talk a little bit about the FBAR. I think a lot of people aren't aware of that when they do business abroad. Yeah. So an FBAR is any time a U.S. citizen has a foreign bank account, um, and it's just an annual reporting that has to be done. Um, you have to report the highest, the highest balance in each bank account that you have. You have to name the bank, the address, the account number. It's a disclosure information. The penalties are very severe. That's what I remember. The penalties do not if you do not file those. Yeah, because yeah. the penalties are something like. Okay, four. one. Go ahead, Craig. One more question about the house. Um, two years ago, it was worth 160000 U.S. dollars. Now, because of the depression in Nicaragua, it's, we might be lucky to get 60000 out of it. Can I take that as a loss? No. No, that's an unrealized, it's an unrealized, that's an unrealized loss. It's no different than if you would have bought Ford Motor stock and, you know, it was it's worth. I'm just making numbers up. Eighty dollars, and it goes down to twenty dollars, and it goes back to sixty dollars. You don't get the you don't get the loss. You get how you figure gain and loss is from the time you purchased it, the value or the cost you paid for it when you purchased it or inherited it, against the price you sell it for. The ups and downs of the market don't have any effect on it. Okay. All right, Craig. So. I appreciate all your help. I really do. How's the weather in Lakeland this morning, Craig? It's a little foggy and cool. I'm out uh, getting ready, getting a few things I need to do because i got to do the lawn today. And uh, all right. My weekend is working in the yard. All right, and one random question. Do you work for Publix? No, I work for uh, Southern Glaciers. But you know someone who works for Publix. 
Oh, yeah. I, I was about to say, if you're from Lakeland, <laughs> right. you either work for Publix or you know someone who works for Publix. That's the headquarters for I, Publix. I, and Mr. George founded the, the company there right on uh, – Right there, across the street from um, oh, yeah, the Lake or uh, the uh, Lone Palm Golf Club. Well, the the first one was over there by the neighborhood I grew up in, uh, Palmetto. But yep, I used to work at Publix, but I uh, found a great job. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Craig. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and good luck with that yard work. Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate You're welcome, you, gentlemen. Yes, sir. All right. All righty, you're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith, 877-943-9673. That's your number to call in today with your legal questions for yours truly or your tax questions for our special guest, CPA Dwayne Bischoff. Again, open phone lines, 877-943-9673, or email me, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. Special thank you to everyone watching on Facebook or watching on Instagram Live. We do appreciate you guys tuning in. To watch live radio, as exciting as that can be. And before we go to Robert, I want to introduce our next topic. Dwayne, you and I were doing a little show prep yesterday, and we were talking about interesting topics. And the topic that came up was was that of crypto, because we were talking about how crypto in our respective fields presents very different, difficult challenges. From my perspective, it's the bequest of crypto accounts, Bitcoin accounts, Bitcoin wallets, and the idea that in our world, we have to value things on date of death. And when you have a regulation that says the value can be within 30 days either side of the date of death, because some of these are typically stocks and they're actively traded, they can fluctuate a lot. Well, Bitcoin can fluctuate a lot in 30 seconds, let alone 30 days. So that's our difficulties why don't you speak a little bit about kind of what crypto is crypto crypto is from the tax perspective and, and sort of the difficulties in taxing crypto? Yeah, so uh, part of it, it's a question that's asked, asked on tax returns now. It's something we have to ask all our clients. You know, have you bought, sold, or held cryptocurrency? Um, the IRS wants to know. And under penalties of perjury, you're answering that truthfully. Um so the crypto now it becomes difficult in again the valuing when when is it valued so if you buy crypto and just hold it as of right now it's not there's not a tax on that until you sell it down the road so it's treated kind of like a stock you you what did you pay for it what did you sell for it the difference is a gain or loss but since it's a type of a currency and treated like a currency so if you used it to go buy a car, you know, you have a gain or loss. You have to figure out your gain or loss. Okay, how much did I pay for this? What's the value of this when I sold it? If you use it to go to dinner and you buy dinner and you spend a hundred dollars at dinner and pay with crypto, now you have to have a gain. So imagine every time you spent money that, you know, your currency we have today are yeah. dollars that you had to figure a gain or loss on each transaction. That's what you have to do with with Bitcoin or well, with and any that's, crypto. And that's the difficulty. I mean, right. there's several difficulties here with it. First of all, it's designed to be an, an alternative to the centralized fiat system where we're cash-based, and it's supposed to be more egalitarian. Uh, it's also very unregulated, right. and that's another concern. But like we were talking before the show, it's kind of the equivalent of this uh, Bitcoin, this peer-to-peer pay system where if you go into a restaurant and you're paying for a meal, if I said – to use what we were just talking about uh, previously, if I use public stock to pay my tab, right? I mean that that's sort of the the equivalent of what we're doing. We mm-hmm. have to do the calculation on the realized gain and, and effectuate all that. And it's also extremely unnerving because when you count it as an alternative to the fiat system, if you ask me who created the financial system as we know it here in the United States of America, most people would agree that's Alexander Hamilton, right? Ask me who created Bitcoin. I mean, it's the, uh, I believe his name is uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, but no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, and there's this big mystery and conspiracy theory behind who it may be. But it's concerning to me <laughs> that it, it almost feels like it could be anyone or it could be a group of someone's, but the anonymity is unsettling to me, and I think that's part of the th- reason why it's so volatile. Is there so many unknowns about it? Right, and I think that's some of the attraction of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Is the privacy uh, of it, well, the, and they can't really—it's hard to track. They can't track it, and and the know. speculative nature of right, it. Absolutely, the, you know the risk and reward. If you listen to Matt Damon, you know, I mean, 
uh, what is it, uh, fortune favors the bold or whatever that, that saying right. is that he was saying right. on the commercial. So, yeah, anyway, if you have a question, tax question, legal question, question about crypto and how it relates to legal and tax, we're happy to help. 877-943-9673. 877-943-9673 or email me patrick at attorney patrick smith.com all right let's go to buffalo new york and let's talk to robert robert welcome to the yes, attorney please. patrick smith are you really in erie county right now i sure am my wife's family is from north tonawanda tonawanda area so uh it's great to talk to you i think you're our first well, caller that's where from I, that's new york where I live. You, you, okay. So my, I'm in Tanawanda. Actually, I'm in Tanawanda, New York. So, ye, many, many years ago, my wife's grandfather ran the Polish meat market there in Tanawanda. Oh, I don't think I don't know that one, but I am Polish. How? <laughs> it's a small <laughs> world. Yes. <laughs> Robert, how can we yes. help you today? Yes. Well, my question is, even though I'm in Buffalo, New York, you know, I do own a condo down in the St. Pete Beach area. My wife and I haven't been able to go because we have a few health problems right now, but I have a car down there, and people always want to borrow my car. They go down and they want to use the car. I, I, I get a little nervous about that. So uh, what's your thoughts about letting other people borrow your vehicle? If I'm driving a rental, it's fine. No, I own the car. <laughs> No, I'm just saying. So, what kind of ve- oh. what kind of vehicle? If you don't mind sharing, Robert, what kind of vehicle is it? It's a Chevy Malibu. A, a Chevy Malibu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought you were going to say it was like a '66 Vet, and I was going to say I completely understand your hesitation in letting people borrow oh. it. I, I think it's a matter of this. I think you have to make sure number one, you have good insurance on the car, and I think number two, you have to make sure you're giving it to an insured driver. And I also think you want to make sure you're not giving it to someone that you know is a negligent driver because you don't want to be accused of something called negligent entrustment where you gave it to someone that you knew had, you know, multiple DUI convictions or had a history of reckless driving or something like that. So if you have actual knowledge of their poor driving, I think that puts you on risk. But I think if it's just general, hey, someone wants to borrow your car, it's good for your car to run. So if you're up in you know Erie County for six months at a time, you don't want your your Chevy Malibu just sitting there, and it's not gonna it's just gonna waste away sitting in the driveway. So you want someone to operate it, and as long as you're insured, they're insured, and they're you know a reasonably good driver, I think you're in good shape there, Robert. Oh, okay. Because I was always nervous about you know the accident factor and. Uh... Uh, if something serious, really serious, happened, like a fatal, I mean, could I be on, you know, I only have so much insurance. Yeah, my experience with that, Robert, but, has been that, you know, personal injury and plaintiff's counsel will typically, in my experience, sue everyone. And if you, if anyone's involved in, in any way, they'll, they'll sue them all and let them fight their way out. Uh, so I think that if that, if something, if, certainly if someone passed away. Uh, you can expect some sort of suit, but odds are with good insurance, it's probably going to go away. If you want to really button that top button in terms of insurance, go ahead and max out home and auto and add an umbrella. Now, I'm not a financial advisor. You should speak to a good licensed financial advisor about the financial aspects of this. Uh, The same with any of you considering crypto out there. Make sure you consult a licensed financial advisor. And I think that that is... Uh, going to make sure that you can rest your head easy on the pillow at night if you have a good umbrella policy for a million or two million dollars. Okay. You know, isn't it funny? Uh, we have we have no programs like yours up here at all. So I have to tune into Florida, <laughs> all the way from Buffalo, to get some good legal advice. Well, you know, and I've joked with my wife because we love New York. Obviously, her family has a connection to upstate, oh. and, and I love the city. And we're both big Broadway supporters. And, you know, I've joked with her over the years about getting my New York State law license. And so maybe we'll just have to do it. Maybe I'll have to bite the bullet, Robert, and get my New York State law license and open an office up there, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. (laughs) All right, Robert. I appreciate you calling in. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith. With me in studio, my special guest, Dwayne Bischoff, CPA. 877-943-9673. That's your live and local number, 877-943-9673. Or you can email me, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. If you're out there and you have crypto 
and you wonder, how do I bequest crypto in my estate plan? This came up when I was doing the uh, show prep yesterday with Dwayne. And the basic rule of thumb here with crypto is the more specific you are in the document, the better. Uh, the general theme here is you don't want to rely on residuary clauses to capture your crypto where that clause says, and any remaining assets to these people. That's not specific enough. You want something that says, and my crypto accounts here with this account number at this website. And a lot of people go ahead because it's dynamic. It's not static. It's changing all the time. They do what we call a separate writing memorandum that is referenced in the will or trust, and then they update that periodically as they move the crypto and update the accounts with usernames, passwords, how to identify it. And that is the most efficient way to bequest crypto. Specificity equals efficiency when it comes to bequesting crypto in your estate plan. So if you have a question about crypto, tax, legal question of any kind, 877-943-9673, 877-943-9673, or email me, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. To reach me at the office during the week, 877-754-6764. That's your toll-free line to schedule your appointment for the Sun City Center Office, Clearwater Office, Haines City, any of those locations, 877-754-6764. Six four. All right, the call board is lit up. Let's go to Michael back in Plant City, and let's talk about real estate. Michael, welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Ah, thank you, Pat. Thanks for the show, by the way. It's oh, thank show. you, I Michael. Every morning, I listen to it every Saturday on my way to work. Well, so. I appreciate but, uh, you faithfully listening. I have a question for you, Michael, before we take your question. Sure. How much is a flat right now? Uh, I think they're like ten bucks a flat. They were. At the, I knew the, the it. Festival last week. I knew. You know, I paid thirty dollars for a flat <laughs> for the, during the first part of the season. It's amazing to me. The as soon as the festival ends, you can. Yeah. They're giving away the strawberries. Yeah. Well, yeah. thirty thirty dollars a flat sound like attorney rate. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying they saw me coming. <laughs> uh, Michael, I appreciate your patience. What's your question? Well, my um, my brother got a divorce like about ten years ago, and or probably longer than that. But the the property that he and his ex wife owned, they still own together, and it, eventually they knew it would go commercial because of the location of the property. So in the, the divorce papers, it states that um, whenever the property sells, they would split the the proceeds of the of the sale. Well, it's coming to the point now where they're going to be closing on the property probably within the next couple of weeks. And my brother apparently sent an email years ago to her saying that, well, if you take care of the, the second mortgage, um, you can have the, the sale of the property. He doesn't remember doing that. So now that they're getting close, she's saying, you sent the email, so I'm not going to let you have any of the property, I'm going to sell the property. Which would... Trump the the you know would the would the the um the divorce decree from the the judge would that would that Trump what his email said? T tell me just in your own layman's analysis, Michael, and I I, I just want to hear your honest opinion. Which just say it out loud with me. Does a judicial order from a judge trump an email? Which in your mind sounds like it has the authority in this position? Well, yeah, I, I think that's what I that's what I told them. I said I, I would think that anything that the judge orders would trump anything that you send because it comes from the judge itself. Yeah, so and, and I want to I want to yeah. be clear because there's probably lots of judges listening right now potentially. So, and we like it that way. We want the judicial order to trump an email. Can you imagine the public policy? of having an email competing, even if it were on lateral with the judicial order, the chaos that would ensue from that. So, no, yeah. I think you're going to yeah. go by that judicial order. If they're unhappy with something in the judicial order, they need to petition the judge for a modification. Yeah, because she's like, you know, you sent the email. You said that if I paid off the second, you wouldn't take any sale, uh, the profit from the sale. And he's like, I don't remember. So now he's kind of worried that. Well, that's exactly it. it this it, is so. why we do written agreements and written decrees, because yeah. memories grow fuzzy. And we put it in writing yeah. so that none of these issues occur. And I think that's the moral of the story. I think your friend needs to go back to their attorney, say, did I agree to this? If I did, great. If I didn't, 
you know, I don't want to. And if, if the wife is unhappy, she could petition her attorney to try to get it modified. Yeah. So basically the judge's orders trumps any email that would he would have sent. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I figured. That's what I told him. So but now, he was worried about it. Now there is the possibility that the judge put in the order unless the parties agree otherwise. It, I, I haven't seen the order is my point, so I would need to look uh, at the order. Yeah. So it's possible that email could be in compliance with the judicial order, but nevertheless, it will not stand for the proposition that the email will ever trump a judicial order. However, the judicial order may permit the modification by email. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, okay. but I doubt he would do that. So. Yeah, it sounds, oh, I, I appreciate it sounds like a wonky deal to me, but anyway, enjoy those strawberries. Yeah, thank you. You guys have a great day. You too, Michael. All right, you're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith, with me in studio, my very special guest, CPA Dwayne Bischoff, 877-943-9673, 877-943-9673. Email your questions, patrick at attorneypatricksmith.com. All right, let's go all the way down to Venice, Florida, and let's talk to Bob about some tax consequences. Bob, welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. How can um, we help? I have a friend of mine that that uh, we're trying to help through something. She's she's living with a boyfriend in the house that his mother owns, and the mother wants to get rid of the house, so she wants to sell it to her, not to him, but to her, for the amount of the mortgage. The house, the mortgage is about thirty eight thousand dollars, and the house is worth about one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. Is there, what are the tax implications on that for the mother and for the value of the property if they, if they do this thing? Okay, so I'm literally, as we're speaking, having to chart that out, Bob, because there's so many moving parts. It's the, the cousin's yeah. dog catcher's boyfriend's cousin. So just to make sure I understand, so you have a friend who has a girlfriend, and they are mutually living in girlfriend's mother's home. Is that accurate? Uh, the opposite. Bob, it's what a, is, we, what uh, is our family friend is, yeah, the, the family friend is the girl. See, this is why we chart the these guy. things out, Bob. We make sure we get it right yeah. the first time. Okay, now that we understand the players, I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne so he can speak to the tax consequences on that, okay? Dwayne is all your Yeah, okay. So the tax consequences for the mother that owns the property is if it's been her personal, has, does she, has she lived there? Has it been her personal residence for two out of the last five years? No, not for two of the last five years. They've lived in it for probably about five or six years, and okay. she's got another house that she lived in. Okay, so it's not her personal not- residence, so now it becomes a sale of a second home. Um, so you'd have right. to look at what her basis is in the property, which is what she paid for it. Mm-hmm. If it's ever been a okay. rental property, she may have depreciated it, so that would reduce her basis. So she would be the difference between what she paid for it and what she's selling it for without regard to depreciation unless she rented it. Um, That would create a gain or loss and it would be reported on the Schedule D on a personal tax return. And, Dwayne, going back to basis, when you mentioned she purchased it for this price, when we were, you know, as attorneys classically trained on uh, taxes and basis, again, they teach us just enough to be dangerous about these things. But I, it's, it was our understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong or tell me if this has changed. If someone's gifted property and A, bought the property at $30,000, but they gifted it to B when it was worth twenty, so it actually gone down in value, B's basis is not the thirty; it's the twenty. It's the lower, lower amount correct. at the time of the gift. Right. So you want to make sure you know that answer too, Bob. I think it, it, more than likely you know, the mother purchased the property, but also if it was by gift – you want to know the value that she paid for it and the value at the time of the gift. So that origin of where the property came from is extremely important in establishing basis. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And I, yeah, I don't know that. Now, they, they have been paying her rent for it, too. So I guess it, she'd consider that a rental property, but I don't know if she'd depreciate it or not. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the question. Do you, a lot of, it, it's, it's interesting. I met with a gentleman the other day who's from the Northeast. And they talked about, oh, yeah, it's a rental property, but nobody ever reports it. And that is like 
foreign to me. I mean, I'm it, pretty sure that's wrong. It's so. definitely wrong, <laughs> okay. but it's like the common thing up on the shore in the Northeast, apparently, and um, is unbelievable to me. Um, oh my gosh! But, but anyhow, yeah, they should be. If you have a rental, you should be reporting it, reporting it on Schedule E. And because what happens if you have a rental property, the IRS, if they ever got looked at these transactions, it's it's depreciable or sh- taken or should have been taken. So even if you don't take it, they act like you should have taken it and reduce your basis. Well, and that is what they call a deemed event. They <laughs> deem it to have occurred. But and a lot of people are playing chicken with the IRS right now. This is something we were talking about right before we went on the air. A lot of people are trying to pull a fast one on the IRS, considering that the IRS is extremely backlogged. You right. have the exact number. How many documents are they behind yeah, now? Twenty three point eight million. Twenty three point eight. There's going to have to be congressional response. <laughs> There's no way you're going to get caught up from that without some sort of congressional relief. Yeah, it's it's all of, it's a it's so it's anything filed on paper. It's amended tax returns. It's tax returns. It's responses to their notices. So now, right now, if we send a letter responding to a notice, it takes them about nine months to open the mail. Well, <laughs> and, and my concern is, too, with this cloud of backlog going on, if it'll lead to more fraud. Mm-hmm. If the fraudsters out there will start to take advantage of that and try to weave their way in, which is only going to create more of a backlog. Yep. But anyway, Bob, did that answer your question? Um, yeah, it clears it up like mud, I think. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> well, welcome to the world of tax, yeah, Bob. Yeah, so. have her see a tax professional. Yeah. That's right. See a tax professional, <laughs> yeah, Bob. And right. Bob, are you listening okay. on the bone? No, uh, 9.30 a.m. 9.30 a.m. We, well, we appreciate you listening, Bob. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Yes, Thank sir. You. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, you're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith. With me, my special guest, CPA Dwayne Bischoff, 877-943-9673, 877-943-9673, or email me, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. Uh, Dwayne, before we go to the very patient Joanne, who's been ever so patient with her question about crypto, give out your contact information. So if people wanted to talk to you privately off the air or schedule a meeting with you in the office, how would they do so? Yes, you can call my main office in Tampa is 813-356-0400, or you can email me at dbb at cpaoftampabay.com. All right, and uh, Dwayne is available, and uh, we let him make use of our office locations for our clients, so he does do a little bit of traveling to meet with appointments, and uh, he'll be happy to help you. All right, let's go to beautiful Sarasota, Florida. Let's talk to Joanne. Joanne, first of all, thank you for your patience, and welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Good morning, Patrick. Good morning, Joanne. Today I find out we have a lot in common. I lived in Lakeland. Did you really? Yeah, my husband was in business there, as was I, and my Patrick was born there. This Patrick was born there, too, at Lakeland Regional Hospital. Right. Right, exactly. This and, Patrick was uh, born there in 1981. When was your Patrick born? 79. Oh, my gosh. That's so close. Did, yes. Did you work for and, Publix and as well? paths may have crossed. My husband was a real estate appraiser and had a business. And I, United First Federal, I ran one of the branches. That's, That's so funny, but I'm older. It's a small world. And what I've learned about Polk County is everybody knows everybody. It, 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 that may it, be the problem. And everybody talks about either Publix or the Red Lobster that used to be owned by Lawton Childs when he was walking Lawton. And there's a handful of, like, Polk County lore that always gets told uh, and, every uh, time you meet another Judd Polk County. adding to it. What's that? The, the, the police chief is adding to it now. Oh, Grady? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Grady, I meant, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, my gosh. Uh, how much do we love Grady Judd? <laughs> We need more. Yeah, you know, and the thing is, if if you were to design a perfect sheriff for Polk County, it would be Grady Judd. I know, I and, know. And God bless Grady Judd and the rest of the Polk County Sheriff and all the men and women of law enforcement throughout our Sunshine State and throughout our well, nation. I'm, I'm there. sorry, I, I almost I moved from there. Now it's so getting so crowded over here on the coast. Yeah, but you did a good move. I mean, Polk County's beautiful, don't get me wrong, but you're in Sarasota, Joanne, so you did okay. <laughs> I know, it's lovely. You have a it's question lovely. about crypto. Yes, I am totally ignorant about crypto. I trade on the market, but I know nothing about crypto. Can I hold a crypto in my hand? My understanding is no, it's it's not tangible. And 
the the research I was seeing on it was that, and Dwayne, you're welcome to correct me. You're certainly more of a crypto guy than I am, but you need a a Bitcoin wallet in order to do this. And as I understand it, there's and this was staggering to me. There is over a market cap of over two hundred billion with a B in cryptocurrency right now, yes. and there's thirty two million active crypto wallets which is staggering. That is staggering. Yeah. So my understanding is, no, it's nothing you hold physically in your hand. I think that's one of the allure right. to it is the idea that it's not traceable. There is no paper trail. And that's why when I was talking about bequesting it, you really have to make extra effort to be extra specific because there's no way to trace it down through a paper trail. But, Dwayne, anything to add to that? No, to be honest <laughs> with you, you, you summed it up pretty well. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's one of those things that's just tricky because you can't, uh, you can't hold it. But like I said, that's one of the things that makes it attractive to people is that it is not it's, – it's a paperless transaction, and people like that. They like the, having this peer-to-peer -peer system that doesn't involve paper and also that goes around the traditional cash system. So I see, and Joe, that's the thing that would make me avoid it. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this. So I had lunch in Polk County with a couple of buddies I went to high school with. This was years ago now, and one the smartest man I ever knew, and I still know him to this day – but I was always so breathtakingly struck by his intelligence because his family, uh, all of them went to Duke. They were all amazing academics, and they didn't own a television in the house. They all read for entertainment. I'll never forget this. And they were the single smartest people I've ever met. He was telling me about and educating me on crypto years ago. And I said, okay, you've convinced me. And I'll throw – and I said something like $1,000 in. He goes, hold on. That's a crazy large number for this. And I was like, if $1,000 is a crazy <laughs> large number for this, how speculative is it? I mean, how how unpredictable can it be? And and that was what taught me my first lesson about crypto. And m indeed, my father's first lesson to me about investing in general was never invest money you can't afford to lose. And I kind of think that's – Sounds you know, like you were talking about the Phillips family. <laughs> did i hit the nail on the no, head? no 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 my dad okay. my dad is don smith and he's an old Publix guy who worked no, with talking about the intelligent folks that didn't oh, have a tv in the house. Oh, oh no 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 this is a buddy of mine his last name was not phillips um oh, okay. I, I don't know that he would want me to say his name on the air no, so i probably won't not but um, in any case uh, yes it was nice talking to both of you well joanne you're a delight enjoy sarasota okay Take care. God bless. God bless Bye -bye. you. All right, you're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith, 877-943-9673. Give us a call now, live and local, 877-943-9673. I'm local Central Florida Attorney Patrick Smith. Multiple office locations throughout the Sunshine State to best serve you. And thank you to all our listeners down on 96.3 Sun Radio and Sun City Center. I will be there on Tuesday meeting with my Sun City Center appointment. So if you want an appointment, give us a call, 877-754-6764. Again, that toll-free number to schedule any uh, complimentary appointment for any of our office locations, 877-754-6764. Call in now with your question for our special guest, CPA. Dwayne Bischoff. All righty, the number, 877-943-9673. Email patrick at attorneypatricksmith.com. All right, let's go to St. Pete. Let's talk to Stuart. Stuart, welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, thank you for uh, taking my call. Sure, Stuart. Um, uh, what I got is a situation where uh, I guess I need to uh, – <laughs> I don't know where I'm getting pushed around and where the law begins and where the law ends and the situation – uh, I have a small business. I have a, uh, uh, a driver who was involved in a uh, four-car accident in uh, Malfunction Junction in Tampa. Uh, uh, someone uh, rear-ended uh, the van that he was driving. Uh, that van was pushed in the back of the Jeep, which was pushed in the back of an Audi, which was oh pushed gosh. in the back of the Cadillac. Uh, uh, technically, uh, no one was hurt, although our well, driver— Praise God for that. Gone, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, our driver's going to the doctor for uh, possible concussion, but that uh, uh, seems otherwise okay. Uh, what my issue is is that the uh, insurance company is saying that we will uh, generously give you uh, $5,000 for, uh, for your van, give us the title, and boy, aren't you lucky, except uh, I can't buy a new van for anything close to $5,000. 
And I kind of had the impression that insurance was supposed to return injured parties to where they were prior to an accident. I, and, I think you're um, not far off there, Stuart. I think it's the idea it's supposed to restore you, but I think it's also depending on the coverage, whether it's, you know, they're going to replace the vehicle or whether they're going to give you value for what you lost. But that's policy to policy. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago, I don't know how long you've been listening to the show, Stuart, but a couple of weeks ago I had attorney Jared Bailey on. He's our personal injury attorney. If you give me a call at the mm-hmm. office on Monday, I'll put you in touch with Jared free of charge. He'll talk to you and get you pointed in the right direction with a complimentary consultation, okay? Hmm. All right. What would be that number, please? Uh, just call me at the office, 877-754-6764. And I'll be happy to get you in touch with Jared, and we'll get you squared away. 6764. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. You're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. I'm your host, Attorney Patrick Smith, 877-943-9673. And you can email me, Patrick, at attorneypatricksmith.com. All right. Let's go to Tampa, and let's talk to Robert. Robert, welcome to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Robert, I have about two minutes. Can you make it relatively expeditious? Yeah, okay. Uh, I inherited it uh, 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 about from from my father around $20,000 worth of, uh, of a property that was uh, sold. And uh, I live in Tampa. And uh, do I have to declare that income from inheritance uh, to my federal taxes? Well, I'll let Dwayne answer that question, Dwayne. It was uh, basically he, his uh, loved one passed, left home property. It was sold. He received $20,000 as an inheritance, Robert. And your question is, do you have to declare that inheritance as taxable income? Is that accurate? Exactly. Yeah, so if you, if it was, if you, if you didn't own the property, if you just, if you just inherited the proceeds from a sale, then generally you don't. The if the estate sold the property, um, or the trust sold the property, they would have a taxable event. If they then gave you the money, they could pass the gain through to you, or they could pay it at the estate level. You need to speak with the personal rep um, of the estate to see. But if the property was given to, you, if you inherited the property through a will, and then sold it, then you would have to report that. Robert, do you currently have an attorney representing you? Uh, not, not, at, not at the moment. All right, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang up with you, wrap up the show, because i got about a minute left, and I'm going to give out the office number so you can give me a call at the office on Monday if you want. We'll be happy to help you, okay? Thank you very much. You're welcome. All righty. You're listening to the Attorney Patrick Smith Show. Dwayne, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been fantastic. And, you know, we were talking, like, we didn't know how to make tax exciting, but I think we did a great job. I mean, we could have come on and talked about which one of the four transfer taxes is your favorite. I don't think that would have been a very good show. I think we did a great job with it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Dwayne, your contact information one more time, please. Yep. Uh, My office number in Tampa is 813-356-0400. And my email is dbb at cpa of tampabay.com and i'm your local central florida attorney patrick smith this is the attorney patrick smith show and we will be back with you next week so write this number down to call in with your questions 877-943-9673 to reach me at the office during the week 877-754-6764 to schedule your complimentary consultation 877-754-6764 or email me patrick at attorneypatricksmith.com god bless go gators (laughs) 